Hey guys, welcome to video 29. Today we're going to discuss a topic that I think is really interesting and that's the common emitter amplifier. Now before we get into the details of that, let's take a look at the three basic amplifier configurations. Starting with the common emitter, we see that the input signal drives the base and the output is taken from the collector. The emitter is connected to common ground, so that's where we get the name common emitter. The common collector, or we're usually going to refer to it as the emitter follower, has the input signal driving the base and the output taken from the emitter terminal, and the collector is connected to ground. Then lastly, we've got the common base where the input signal drives the emitter, the output is taken from the collector, and the base is connected to ground. Now, each of these configurations has their own strengths and weaknesses, and I've compiled some of their main characteristics into this table below. So let's start with the common emitter. And the first thing we see is that it's got inverting voltage gain and current gain. Now what that means is if you put in a sine wave, you're going to get out an inverted sine wave. All right. Um, it's the only configuration that inverts. The voltage gain of the common emitter can be pretty high. That means the output can be really big compared to the input. Its current gain is less than the beta of the transistor you use to build the circuit. It's got the highest power gain of all three configurations, and it's got medium input resistance, medium output resistance. Um, I'll explain that uh, in context later on as we go through, but for right now just consider that to be a qualitative description. The emitter follower has the lowest output resistance of all three configurations, so it's the most suitable for driving low impedance loads. It's got a voltage gain less than one, its current gain is less than the beta of the transistor you're using, and its power gain is less than the current gain. It's got a medium input resistance similar to the common emitter, but it's got a very low output resistance. And the common base amplifier has the best frequency response of all three configurations, so it's the one that you're most likely to see used in, say, radio frequency amplifier applications. It's capable of pretty high voltage gain similar to the common emitter. Its current gain is less than one power gain is less than the beta of the transistor. Its input resistance is low and it's got a moderate or medium output resistance. Now I've put the three definitions of voltage gain, current gain, and power gain over here uh, simply as a refresher because we're going to be using those a lot in this uh, discussion. All right, the next thing we want to do is look at an actual common emitter amplifier and that's what I've got here. I've set up Q1 using fixed base biasing and notice that I've got my source connected to the base through a capacitor C1 and my load resistor connected to the collector through C2. C1 and C2 are called coupling capacitors. The function of a coupling capacitor is to pass AC signals through relatively unattenuated while blocking DC levels. Now let's look at C1 for a second. What it does is uh, prevents the DC voltage at the base from being uh, seen by this source and also if we connected this source directly to the base because it's got zero internal resistance it would short the base to ground and that would screw up our Q point. So this capacitor does two things. Prevents this source from screwing up our Q point and prevents this DC voltage from appearing across that source. Now C2 uh, blocks the DC collector voltage and keeps it from appearing across the load resistor while simultaneously letting the signal uh, couple to the load. All right now the first thing we want to do when we analyze an amplifier is determine its Q point. All right so to do that with this circuit, we're going to deactivate the signal sources and replace the caps with open circuits. All right, that gives us this equivalent circuit, and we're going to determine all of the normal DC uh, parameters plus these two new ones that we've been working with. All right, the transistor uh, device parameters are over here. Beta is 100. It's silicon. 
Our early voltage is 100 volts. Our thermal voltage is about 26 millivolts. So using these parameters, let's go over here and complete the rest of this analysis. Starting with the base current, for this circuit, the base current is VCC minus VBE divided by RB. All right, so let's pull up our calculator and VCC is 10 minus 0.7 is 9.3 divided by 220, whoops, that's 220,000 gives us a base current of about 42 microamps. All right, our collector current ICQ equals beta times IB. All right, so beta is 100, base current is 42 microamps. That's about 4.2 milliamps. All right, VCEQ is equal to VCC minus ICQ times RC. All right, so we've got 10 volts minus 4.2 mils times 1K is 4.2 volts. So that's about 5.8 volts. Our VCE at cutoff is simply 10 volts. And our collector saturation current, IC sat, for this circuit is VCC over RC. So 10 volts divided by 1K is 10 milliamps. All right, so that's the normal DC analysis stuff that we've done in numerous uh, examples before this. All right, so let me clear this stuff out of here and let's look at our last two parameters here, little re and little ro. These are the parameters that transition us from the DC world to the small signal AC world. Remember, little re is approximately equal to V sub T over ICQ. So that's 26 millivolts divided by 4.2 milliamps, and that is 26 divided by 4.2, about 6.2 ohms. All right, so let's write that here, 6.2 ohms. And little ro, remember, is approximately V sub A, the early voltage divided by ICQ. So that's 100 volts divided by 4.2 milliamps. And let's see what that gives us. 100 divided by 0 0.0042. It's about 23.8 K ohms. I'll write that up here. 23.8 K ohms. All right. Now let me clear the workspace and I'm going to bring over the DC load line for this circuit just to get a graphical idea of where the transistor is operating. So here's our DC load line. Bring it over for us to take a look at and here's what we've got. Uh, VCE cut off 10 volts, IC sat 10 milliamps, Here's our Q point at 5.8 volts, 4.2 mils, and it's fairly close to the center. So um, everything looks good. All right, now let's start our AC analysis, okay? So what we need to do is create an AC equivalent circuit much like we did here. All right, so we'll go down to the next page and what we're gonna do next is deactivate all DC sources Okay, so that means we're going to basically turn our power supply voltage down to zero, leaving only the internal resistance, which is a short to ground. So I can draw R sub B going to ground and R sub C going to ground. All right, we're going to replace all the capacitors with short circuits because we assume that our operating frequency X sub C is approximately zero, and that leaves us with this equivalent circuit. Now there's a lot of stuff going on here, uh, but let's look at these currents for a second. The current that comes out of the VN source splits between the base resistor and the transistor. The current that actually does useful work is I sub B, 
I sub RB is just wasted. Similarly, the collector current splits between the collector resistor and the load resistor, and the only current that does useful work is the current that goes through the load, so I sub RC is wasted. Now, it would be nice to be able to get rid of this, but we need these resistors to bias the transistor up, so that's just something that we have to live with. Now, also notice that RC and RL are effectively in parallel for the AC equivalent circuit, so I can replace them with our prime C. All right, now before we go on, I want to take a look at the AC active region model for the transistor. And here it is. Okay, now this is the model we've been using. Little r sub o here, little re, and the high value of little ro effectively isolates the collector side from the base side and because the collector current doesn't affect the base current the transistor is a unilateral device that is signal flow only goes from left to right not from right to left all right that's not something super important to us now but i wanted to introduce the concept here all right, and also because R sub O is so big compared to little re, we can just bring it external here and put it directly in parallel with RC and RL without uh, causing very much error. And normally we're just going to do that with little R sub O, but since it's so big, we can also pretty much disregard its existence here. And uh, that's what we're going to do very often when we can get away with it. All right, so because R sub O is so big, we'll consider it to be infinite and we'll kind of ignore its effect on these two resistors. All right, now one more point. Now, if you go back to video 12, we derived the relationship that says that the input resistance looking into the base is approximately equal to beta times the resistance in the emitter. Rather than go through the algebra to show that again, uh, we're going to do enough algebra anyway. I'm just going to use that result, and if you want to see where it came from, go back to video 12 at around the 9-minute mark, and you'll see where this relationship came from. And finally, if we apply Ohm's law, we get the small signal AC base current is equal to Vn divided by beta times little re. We're going to use both of these results uh, soon in some analysis, so keep those in mind. Okay, now let's go back over, and what I'm going to do is kind of combine this uh, representation with the active region model into something that looks maybe a little bit easier to wrap our heads around, and here it is. All right, I'm showing the uh, collector current source and little re right on the transistor symbol and I'm not uh, showing little r sub o because it's big enough to ignore. All right and what we've got here is the input resistance of this amplifier is equal to the base resistor in parallel with the resistance looking into the base terminal which is beta times little re. So there's the input resistance of this amplifier. Now, the voltage gain is negative R prime C over little re, and I'm going to show you where that comes from. So let's come over here and look at V out. It's equal to the collector current times the collector resistance R prime C, but notice the direction gives us a polarity like this. All right, so we're actually looking at the negative side of this resistor, so V out is equal to negative... IC times R prime C. All right, so that's where the phase inversion comes from. We've got a negative output voltage with a positive input voltage. All right, now we can define the collector current. IC is equal to beta times IB, right? And IB is given as VN over beta times RE, so we're going to substitute that back into here, and we get V out equals negative VN times beta times R prime C divided by beta times little re. Now that's horribly messy, but notice that the betas cancel, and if we divide both sides by V in, we get voltage gain, which equals V out over V in, which equals 
negative r prime c over little r e, which is what we've got over here. All right. Now, the other two relationships are true for any amplifier, okay, and that is the current gain is equal to voltage gain times Rn over Rl, and power gain is AV times AI. So these relationships apply to any amplifier. These two apply only to this particular uh, amplifier. All right, now let's put all this stuff together and do the rest of the analysis here. All right, so here's our amplifier. Our input resistance we know is Rn equals Rb in parallel with beta times little re. So that's 220 k ohms in parallel with 100 times 6.2 ohms. Remember that was our little re. So we've got 220k in parallel with 620. Now this is so big compared to this that we're going to just forget about it and we'll say our input resistance is approximately 620 ohms. Okay, So R in for this amplifier 620 ohms. This source thinks it's looking at a 620 ohm resistor. Alright, the voltage gain a sub v equals negative r prime c over little r e. So r prime c was r c in parallel with r l. 1k in parallel with 1k is 500. So we got 500 ohms divided by 6.2 ohms. And that gives us a voltage gain of 500 divided by 6.2 uh, let's say a, yeah, about 81. Okay, so we've got a gain of about negative 81. All right, our current gain, A sub I, is equal to AV times Rn over RL. So that's going to be negative 81 times 620 divided by RL is 1000. All right, so that's 620 divided by 1,000 is 0.62. So our current gain is 81 times 0.62, which is about 50. All right, so let's write that. Let's write those both over here. Negative 81, and remember our current gain is negative as well, so and that's negative 50. And our power gain is the product of those two, A sub P equals AV times AI. So we've got a negative times a negative, which is positive. So we've got 50 times 81 is about 4,050, which is pretty impressive. So this amplifier gives us a power gain of over 4,000. Voltage gain is negative 81, pretty good. And the current gain is about negative 50, that's half of beta. That's not too bad either. All right, now we want to figure out what happens when we apply a signal that's 5 millivolts peak at 1 kilohertz. All right, so let me clean off my workspace here. And let's uh, do a little bit of calculations. Okay, so we've got V out equals AV times V in. So that's negative 81 times 5 sine 2 pi 1000 T millivolts. And let's see what we've got here. 81 times oops, 0 0.005 is about, eh, let's call it negative 0.41, negative 0 0.41 sine 2 pi 1000 T volts. So with a 5 millivolt sine wave coming in, we're going to get out an inverted sine wave that's about 410 millivolts peak. 
all right that's negative 0 0.41 sine 2 pi 1000 t volts and what would we see if we connected a sil an oscilloscope up to the circuit channel 1 here channel 2 here well here's what we would see now let me drag this over and here is our circuit waveforms the input voltage 5 millivolts peak would barely be visible here and we're getting about negative 410 millivolts for this peak positive 410 millivolts for that peak so there's what we would see on the oscilloscope for this amplifier all right now this is just our first analysis where we derived some equations and you know took a look at this thing we're going to do a lot more with this so let me summarize what we've got so far all right the following equations apply to any bipolar junction transistor little rce or little ro is equal to approximately the early voltage over icq all right usually little ro is large enough to ignore and it mainly affects voltage gain little re the dynamic emitter resistance vt over icq or if we want to be a little bit more accurate in estimating it eta times vt where eta is about 1.5 typically over icq usually it's pretty low often less than 10 ohms it's very dependent on temperature and icq and it can cause the voltage gain to be very unpredictable if your biasing arrangement is not very stable all right these two equations for rn and av apply specifically to the amplifier that we did in this example okay we'll have to modify these if we use other uh, amplifier uh, modifications okay so these ones are going to change as we move on to different amplifiers or at least they're going to be modified these two equations apply to any amplifier as well now what we're going to be doing next is taking a look at the effects of emitter feedback on voltage gain in rn we're going to do some ac load line analysis and large signal characteristics and that stuff's really fun and interesting so make sure you stick around for that and tell all your friends and i'll see you guys next time around